my Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and it is Christmas season 2021, and it's also 20 years since The Fellowship of the Ring was released in theaters for the first time. And so I wanted to do kind of a look back at The Fellowship of the Ring in a positive light. Those of you who have been with me for a while know that I am very critical of certain aspects of Peter Jackson's movie trilogy, and even more so of his Hobbit trilogy, but The Fellowship of the Ring especially, and to a lesser extent The Two Towers and The Return of the King, were very, very good experiences overall for me. And this is back before I was even 20 years old. These were released after I had read the book at least once or twice. And so when I knew they were coming out with the movies, I was really hyped up. This is in an age before... You know, you really had to worry too much about political agendas interfering with your your content. There was a lot of hope and a lot of expectation, but also a lot of worry because not not because anybody was particularly worried about necessarily political stuff, but because people were worried about can you really adapt this story to a movie form? You know, is this going to work? Is it going to be cheesy? And then people were worried about Peter Jackson because, like, everything he had done before had been, like, slasher movies, horror movies, just all kinds of stuff that didn't really at all fit the genre. And then we all saw The Fellowship of the Ring in theaters, and we were all amazed because The Fellowship of the Ring, in no uncertain terms, is one of the best movies ever made. And I don't say that as just a fanboy. I say that as... And, and as objective as I can be, a observer of, you know, mass media, you know, just different kinds of storytelling. Now, I'm not a movie expert, I'm not a movie critic, and I'm not claiming that it's the best movie ever made, I'm just saying that it's one of the best movies ever made, because it was done so well. All, of, all three of the movies were done really well for the most part. There are issues that I would have with the later two movies... Fellowship of the Ring, in my opinion, is the best overall of the three because it maintains the high quality throughout. And there's really nothing to nitpick if you don't know the main story from the books because outside of that context, everything in the Fellowship works internally for the most part. So, I mean, you can nitpick at a few things here and there maybe, but the vast majority of it is it works just absolutely wonderfully. So what I want to do in this video is look back at the Fellowship, why it was so successful, and what it kind of means for, or meant, for, you know, movies and TV shows going forward. Because the Fellowship of the Ring, in a big way, is what told the world that, hey, audiences really are hungry for stuff like this. That didn't die out with the days of, you know, big epics like Ben-Hur and, you know, all those old classic long movies that, you know, don't get made anymore. People still want long-form, really good stories told in a cinematic format. So, let's talk about The Fellowship of the Ring, 20 years after release. So, one of the obvious things to note about The Fellowship of the Ring is just the technical stuff. Technically, it's just a fabulous movie. There's so many good things about it. The costuming is great. The, you know, the costuming by itself is an amazing feat. I mean, these people made chainmail, real chainmail out of real rings that took hours and hours and hours to produce. It is amazing what they accomplished with their budget. I mean, they had a big budget, don't get me wrong, but it was nothing like anything that had been seen for a long time. The, the level of detail that went into costumes, that went into set production, set design, all of that stuff was just amazing. The cinematography was top-notch. If you know what to look for, you can see some of the cinematic tricks they pull. There's the famous scene in Bag End when Gandalf and Frodo were talking about the ring, and it looks like they're sitting across from each other, but in fact what's really going on is Frodo is you know, back from the camera quite a bit more to make it look like he's smaller and they're just looking at each other but not really at each other because they're each looking at something blank <laughs> at the wall opposite them. But it's so convincing. If you don't know to look at it, to look for it, you'd never know they were not 
right across from each other and totally different sizes. The way they used, you know, size doubles, stunt doubles, I mean, everything just amazing. They did it all with mostly practical effects. I mean, they used some CGI, obviously, for different things, but the the amount of practical effects they used, the real makeup, and this is a, one of the criticisms that comes up in terms of The Hobbit, you know, they CGI'd all the orcs and goblins, whereas in The Lord of the Rings, they had prosthetics, makeup, and poor John Rhys Davies, of course, he had the allergies to his own prosthetics, but he went through it, and you know, just the the level of detail and dedication to really making everything seem as real as possible. This is one of the areas in which the Fellowship does such a great job because one of the things that it does is it really immerses you in the world. It has that verisimilitude that Tolkien was going for in his own stories. Does it achieve it in the same way that Tolkien did? No, it's a different media format. It's, you know, not a book, it's a movie. But for what it is, it does a superb job of drawing you in, making you feel like you're in Middle-earth, like Middle-earth is a real place, a real time, something you could experience yourself if only you had been born somewhere else in a different time. And that is, by itself, a huge accomplishment. And the fact that they put all that work into it to make it happen, that's one of the things that makes Fellowship of the Ring just amazing. Another thing that they did extremely well, of course, is casting. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about the casting in this movie is the fact that I knew almost none of the characters, almost none of the actors, I should say, beyond maybe a few roles prior to this. Like, I knew who Sean Bean was. I knew who... Um, I think I had already seen Elijah Wood play the Artful Dodger before, but I'm not 100% sure of that. I don't think I had seen Viggo Mortensen in anything. This was um, Orlando Bloom's first major role that I was... I mean, he's been in a couple things before that, but I'd never seen him in anything. Uh, just so many of these actors I didn't really have any preconceived notions about. You know, I didn't know enough of any of their work to really have an idea. And so going into it like that, it was really nice because you don't have any baggage and a lot of these guys were relatively new on the scene. Like, Hugo Weaving had just done The Matrix, but that was still relatively new at the time. You know, Elijah Wood was a young and up-and-coming actor, so was, you know, Dominic Monaghan. Ian McKellen had been around for years, but, you know, mostly in British stuff, and other than that, kind of the X-Men. And that was, you know, that was the real, probably only major thing that American audiences would have known him for. Christopher Lee, of course, had a huge, long history of being in cinema, and so, I mean, you'd have to have lived under a rock. But Saruman was so perfectly cast in terms of Christopher Lee that I didn't care. I mean, Christopher Lee is probably literally the best person that could have ever been cast in that role, period. And that's another thing. Quite apart from knowing who any of these people were, these guys all did their jobs so well. Like, I mean, some of them didn't do as well as others at acting, but most of them did at least good to very good, and many of them were superb. Like, Sean Astin, I don't think is necessarily the best actor, but he certainly played the role of Samwise as well as probably just about anybody could. And he's so lovable because even though he is goofy, that's kind of part of the way that Sam's character was written. So it works, even though he's maybe a little bit hammy at times. Sam is kind of hammy. I mean, you know, nothing in the casting could be faulted in terms of why did you cast that guy as this character? Um, so, so many things about the casting just worked so well. Ian McKellen great Gandalf. I, you know, it'd be hard to pick anybody better. Viggo Mortensen, I don't think he's the best person to play book Aragorn, but movie Aragorn, I think he works. Um, so there's just so many ways in which the casting turned out to be just absolutely phenomenal. Now, some of the writing you could maybe disagree with here and there. Frodo plays an extremely passive role in the movies compared with the books. And so in that sense, you know, 
there's there's a way in which it works within the story, but it's also kind of weak. It's like you don't want your protagonist to be just a passive hanger on who does nothing. And that's kind of what Frodo is for a lot of the whole trilogy, not even just the Fellowship of the Ring. So it's it, it's kind of unfortunate in that way, but it like I said, in some way it works within the context of the movie and the way they were telling the story, which admittedly is different than the way that Tolkien told the story. So, you know, leaving that aside, you could still criticize the way that they wrote Frodo, but it's not you know, if you're not comparing it to the books, it's not as bad of a decision as it might have been. So there are maybe some things that could have been improved, certainly, but overall the writing was really good, and it helped so much that they took a lot of the things straight from the book. I mean, they changed things, obviously, and they added, you know, a lot of humor and a lot of other stuff that was not in the original, which... It's kind of a shame that they didn't use more of the humor from the book itself because there was definitely some there to be had, and I think it would have worked well. Uh, but they kind of, you know, shied away from some of the stuff in the book because a lot of the humor comes up in the context of hobbits talking to each other, and then you have Legolas being kind of a smart alecky <laughs> with Gandalf a couple times. Um, so there's humor there, but in the context of the way they were doing it, it wouldn't really have worked. They didn't have time to have Frodo, Sam, and Pippin wander all over the Shire for like two chapters worth of material to finally get on the road. And that's another aspect in which I can say that these movies, and Fellowship in particular, did a mostly really good job. As an ad adaptation, you know... All things considered, it could have been a whole lot worse. Bear in mind, originally the idea was to make two movies out of the material, not three. And so the fact that we got three is by itself kind of a small miracle and allowed so much of the stuff to make it into the movies that might not otherwise have. But they also did a really good job of compressing where they could and where they kind of had to. So... You know, one of the things that a lot of people complain about is there's no Tom Bombadil. I perfectly well understand why you would cut Bomb Bombadil and most of the Old Forest, if not all the Old Forest, which of course they did in this movie. You know, it's, it's a long digression which doesn't contribute much to the plot. And Bombadil, I think you could portray him in a movie, but it would be difficult. You would have to find just the right actor and you would have to have somebody directing and acting just right to, to really capture who Bombadil is without it seeming cheesy or just silly. So I can understand why you would skip it for those reasons. And again, just the timing issue. The, the movie's already over three hours long. And once you start adding in Old Forest and Tom Bombadil, you've got a monster of a movie that just gets so long. So you have to cut things. And one of the ways in which they cut things kind of intelligently, and this is just a really good example of how they managed to do this in, in terms of adapting certain things from the book to the movie, the book has Frodo meet Bilbo in Rivendell, you know, before the council and at a, you know, after dinner thing in the Hall of Fire, that's when Bilbo asks to see the ring, not when they're packing up and giving Frodo the chainmail shirt and all that other stuff, which is how it goes down in the movie. And it's in that scene that Bilbo, you know, kind of reaches for the ring. And what we get in the book is Frodo sees, but Bilbo does not actually change his appearance to, you know, like an almost Gollum-like character reaching for the ring and he almost hits him. Like, he raises his fist, I think, even. And this is portrayed in the Ralph Bakshi version of, of The Lord of the Rings, where they have this meeting, and, and you can see Frodo raise his hand like he's going to hit Bilbo. And then only later is there a scene where, you know, Bilbo gives Frodo the Mithril shirt and Sting, and, you know, they go through all this stuff, and it, you know, the ring doesn't come up again. So when you're trying to cut down the story for time purposes, the movie does this kind of really 
smartly. It changes the nature of the scene because of the way they do it, but it still works for most of the purposes you want, and it makes the two scenes into one thing. So, you know, Frodo is getting ready to go. Bilbo is giving him Sting in the Mithril shirt, and he says, let me see you put on the Mithril shirt, and he starts unbuttoning his vest, and he's going to put it on, and there's the ring, and Bilbo suddenly sees it, and, you know, the desire to hold it again comes over him, you know, just kind of unexpectedly. It's not like he knew that he had it and just went up and asked. And so in the context of that, then Frodo starts buttoning his vest back up to not let Bilbo have it, and Bilbo gets all, bah! uh One of the <laughs> few scare, a jump scare type things in any of the trilogy. Uh, and so we get that visual image that we don't really see in Bakshi's, because Bakshi doesn't depict it, but we get kind of what Frodo sees, and we get Bilbo's reaction, and all of this stuff all happens in the same scene in a way that conveys most of what we want to know from it, all together with the stuff with the Mithril shirt, and so it's collapsed, but it still handles everything. So that's really smart adaptation writing in terms of looking at how do we take the material the book presents us and not tell it all, but still manage to tell almost all of it by taking certain scenes, putting them together in, in ways that convey almost all the same information, just in shorter scenes and fewer scenes. So that's another way in which the movies did a really good job. For the most part, they adapted it really well. Now... You could make complaints about some of the ways they did that, and I certainly have my own. But remember, a lot of what people were afraid of with these movies was way, way worse than what we got. And just FYI, I mean, you probably can guess this about me. I'm that guy who, after the movie was over, was complaining to my family all the things that they changed and how it was dumb and... You know, like one of the scenes that I remember specifically complaining about was the weather top attack. Frodo wakes up and the hobbits are making food over a fire and he's like, Why do you have a fire? Put it out! And of course that's exactly backwards from the book. Because in the book, Aragorn tells them, Fire is our friend in the wilderness. Sam is the one who's against it because he's like, What a great way to tell people, here we are. And Aragorn's like, No, the Black Riders do not love fire. We're going to build a fire. So there's... Elements like that that I complained about that I thought were kind of stupid changes. And, you know, I can see why they did it the way they did it. I don't necessarily think it was the best decision ever. But overall, the adaptation was about as good as I've ever seen a movie adapt a book for anything. I mean, there's never been a completely... Well, I shouldn't say never. There have probably been a few, very few, that have done a better job accurately adapting book to movie. But it's very rare. And a lot of the time what happens is, even if it's accurate, it leaves out a ton of material. That was my experience with the Harry Potter movies. And especially as you get further into the series and the books get bigger and bigger and bigger and the movies don't, you start losing a lot of material. So even when movies are accurate, they omit a lot. And in this, we got some omissions, certainly, and some changes, certainly. But on a standard of how movies adapt books, it's pretty up there in terms of how well it was done. So, and despite my, you know, laundry list of complaints that I had after watching the movie, when it came out on video, I watched it like 25 times within the next year. Because the movie was just that good. So there's all these things about The Fellowship of the Ring that I really do love. And one of the things that I like about it is the ability to visualize. Like, I am, I have a terrible visual imagination. I have a hard time really imagining what, you know, fantasy worlds should look like and stuff like that. So to be able to see it on the screen in such lavish detail with the, the way that they did everything for these movies was just an amazing experience to me. There are things here I would disagree with, too. Like, for example, elves having curved swords. I disagree with that because we know from the text, mostly, that curved swords are almost always an orc thing. Um, but, you know, by and large, just the aesthetics of the 
the whole production, I have no complaints. There might be things I would do differently based on what I know from the lore, but, you know, given the decisions they made, it all looks good, at least. So, there are so many things about this movie that I just really loved, and even though I did have my complaints. And one of the things that it meant going forward, like I said, we now had a precedent for, all right, now we can really, you know, expect movie studios to do more of this kind of thing. The disappointing thing is it took a long time for most studios to really start doing anything like this. I mean, we just didn't have a whole lot of really great follow-up to that. We still had, you know, the Harry Potter series that continued on, but it was, you know, again, the movies weren't that long, and they were adapting book by book, and, you know, one of the things that came really soon after was the Pirates of the Caribbean stuff. The The first entry in that I thought was really good and really successful. That kind of went downhill pretty quickly, unfortunately, uh, but the idea, at least, was there, that we're going to make an epic kind of franchise-type thing that's, you know, going to be... And the beauty of it was it was new. It wasn't even just an adaptation. I mean, it was kind of an adaptation of a amusement park ride, but you know what I mean. Uh, not an ad- adaptation of a book or anything like that. And it's only really more recently that we've started seeing more adaptations of really big works, like the Wheel of Time series is now out. We've got... Other things like that are being done in more long-form series and stuff like that. But without The Lord of the Rings having the success that it had and being as good as it was, would any of that have even been possible even now? Would, would anybody be willing to risk anything on that? You know, I think The Lord of the Rings really showed that there is a whole lot of potential for these kinds of stories, whether they're original, whether they're adaptations, whatever it is, you know, the Fellowship of the Ring was such a great success and did what it did so well that it at least proves that even if studios aren't usually willing to take the risk, it is a risk that could and probably should in many cases be taken because if done right, these kinds of movies can be massive successes. And so... Going forward, I hope we see more really good stuff like that. We've got the Amazon Lord of the Rings series coming in the future. I am reserving judgment on that. I have my doubts and I have my hopes, and what that all turns out to be when it comes out, nobody knows. Um, But one can hope, at least, that a lot of studios will continue to find things that they can do in that vein that are not just retreading old ground. And it's really sad because so many movies lately have been either remakes or, you know, reboots or whatever, and it's really gotten kind of disappointing to see how unimaginative studios are when we have precedent like this. Peter Jackson, a guy who had never done an epic movie in his life, never done a fantasy movie in his life, had a vision for how to do the Lord of the Rings, and he and Philippa Boyens and Fran Walsh made it happen, and they made it happen in a big way. And it takes studios willing to take risks, and it takes budgets, and it you know it takes all these things. But we have seen that it can work, and Fellowship of the Ring proved that. Now. It still takes other people being willing to take other risks in the future to have more of it. But you would think, hopefully, somebody would see that and go, you know what, I can find another really good story like that and bring it to life on the screen. Whether it actually happens remains to be seen. And there have been some examples, like I said, Pirates of the Caribbean. The first one I thought was a really great attempt at doing something very similar. And I I think... There have probably been others that I might have missed over the years. I've never been a huge moviegoer, so there's probably several things that have been just things that I've missed over the time. But there's been nothing at all to rival the Lord of the Rings itself. The Lord of the Rings movies, really long, really big, really lavish movies that really just will blow an audience away. Very little of that. And while I, you know, I have my biases, I think that Tolkien's story is one of the best ever written, that's not to say that there aren't other really good ones out there 
to bring to life on the screen that, you know, lots of people would enjoy. So even though Lord of the Rings is my personal favorite, there's still a lot of room out there for others to find their place. And so hopefully that'll still happen in the future with other, you know, major stories, whether original or adapted from books or whatever. But that's, you know, kind of my reminiscence and perspective on 20 years of The Fellowship of the Ring. So what are your thoughts 20 years after the re release of The Fellowship? Are you looking back on it with kind of a jaded eye thinking, eh, that didn't work out so well? Do you look back with fond memories like I do? Do you have hopes and dreams or fears and doubts? You know, what, what are your thoughts on the movie as a whole 20 years down the line? Let me know in the comments below. Please give the video a thumbs up and share it around. Please also subscribe and click the bell icon to make sure you catch all my content in the future. You can also find me on Rumble and Odyssey and catch podcast versions of these as well. You can find me on Twitter at JRRTLore, and you can support me over at Patreon. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore channel. Namadie.